Yes. Yeah, I'm Vincent Saxtetter. Um, and I just want to talk to you a little bit about the virtual machine and what we're trying to do with the virtual machine here at this school. Um, so just to, just to provide some motivation for why we're giving you a virtual machine, um, the purpose of this school is to teach you how to use ComSuite to calculate strongly correlated systems. Um, so, and not just to use it, but in order to use it, of course, you'll have to install it. So the best way to do this is by, to learn this is by experience, by actually really doing the installation and the use of ComSuite. So we give you ComSuite virtual machine to provide a soft start, okay? So already, as soon as you install virtual machine, the virtual machine, you'll be uh, able to run ComSuite, even though you won't have, or have installed it yet, because we've already done the installation in the virtual machine. And you'll be able to experiment with materials that are interesting to you. Um, and, uh, um, <coughs> um, and then uh, also, when, when you're ready, uh, there's also uh, inside of the virtual machine, you'll be able to go through the steps of compiling ComSuite um, because we've uh, already done the compilation in, in the virtual machine. We have everything set up so you can do it and there, no troubleshooting will be required. You can just go ahead and do it. Um, so you'll have done it for a first time on the virtual machine and that'll give you some idea of what you'll need to do on other machines. And in the hands-on sessions, uh, we'll give you a dedicated time and space uh, uh, for learning how to use ComSuite. So there'll be the virtual machine easing your learning process. There'll be tutorials guiding you uh, through many of the calculations you can do with ComSuite. Also the ComSuite team will, is online on Slack, uh, ready to discuss and troubleshoot. And we'll also, we're not, we're not only if, if you choose during the school to also install and, and run ComSuite on other platforms, on other computers, we will encourage you and, and support you in that process too, both during and after the school. Um, so then I want to explain what a virtual machine is. Um, it's basically a second computer that you run on your host computer. Um, and, um, uh, your host computer, I mean your PC or your laptop. So the, the virtual machine and ComSuite inside of your virtual machine, they don't know they're being hosted. They don't know anything about the host computer. They don't have any interaction with your PC or your laptop. They don't know about it. Um, so if there's software installed on your laptop or your PC, your, your virtual machine doesn't know anything about that. Um, there is a way of sharing a directory with your host computer but that's turned off to start with. Um, and uh, there's a way to turn it on. Um, but um, basically that's the point of the virtual machine is to, to provide a wall between, between the OS that we're supplying you with and the OS you already have installed. Um, uh, OS means operating system. Um, the virtual machine and ComSuite do of course consume resources, memory, CPU, disk space, internet. Okay. And then another way of saying what a virtual machine is, it's the, the memory, the CPU, the disk space and the internet that it's consuming. It's also an operating system, which we've installed for you. We've installed Ubuntu 1804. Um, it's also all the configuration that we've done of the virtual machine, including any compilers and libraries that we installed and that are needed to run. ComSuite. The virtual machine is also the ComSuite software. And also because we based our virtual machine on the quantum mobile virtual machine, uh, it's many other ab initio software packages that come with the ComSuite virtual machine. So uh, I just wanna briefly say how to set up the virtual machine. First of all, you should make sure that on your host computer, your PC or your laptop, there should be at least 30 gigabytes of free disk space. That's because just downloading, the downloaded image of the virtual machine takes around seven gigabytes that will have to be stored on your hard disk. And then, and then you'll install that. And once you've installed it, your virtual machine will be consuming around 20 gigabytes of hard disk on your, 
Uh, so that's 27 already. And then of course you want to have some more memory, some, some more disk space left out, left over after that for your own host computer to use. So probably you actually want 50 gigs of hard disk space open um, before you installed your, your virtual machine. Okay. Um, and then next you should know how much RAM, how much memory your computer has and how many CPUs your computer has. Um, some, some computers now have even four Sometimes if you have a real whopper of a computer, computer maybe eight CPUs. Uh, but uh, uh, I'd say most 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 computers nowadays probably have two CPUs. Um, it used to be computers only had one. So you can see how many CPUs you have and how much RAM you have, how much memory. And of that, you you need to select how much memory you want your virtual machine to have. You should make sure that there's some left over for your host, um, so that your so that your host computer doesn't grind to a halt when your virtual machine starts working. Um, so the next step is to download and install and start VirtualBox from, uh, from the VirtualBox website. So I, here's the VirtualBox website. There's virtualbox.org up there. Um, and now I'll click on, well, where's the install screen? Um, download VirtualBox. And now it gives me platforms to install on. You pick whether you have Windows, Mac, Linux, and you click there and it will give you something, a download. You'll download that on your computer and then you'll, the installer, then you'll click on the installer to make it run. Um, <laughs> uh, right. Um, so after you've downloaded and you install, then you, then you run VirtualBox. So here I'll show you it running. Here's what VirtualBox looks like while it's running. Okay, Oracle VM VirtualBox Manager. The next thing you do is you go and you download the, the Com Suite virtual machine. We have two download points for you. One is on Dropbox and one is on Google Drive. So you go there, you download it. Um, and then after you've downloaded it, downloaded it you go to back to the virtual machine and you select file. Here's the file menu for the virtual, set for the virtual box software. You go to file and you click the import appliance menu option. And then you go and you select the virtual machine that you just downloaded. So, um, So for instance, here it is. So you, you click on that, you press open, continue. And here it's gonna give you a, a dialogue allowing you to select how many CPUs the virtual machine should have at its disposal, how much RAM it should have at its disposal. So on my computer, for instance, there's six gigabytes of memory, but I've told a virtual box that this virtual machine should only have five gigabytes of memory for it. So that leaves 11 gigabytes free for, for my host computer to use. Uh, my host computer has four CPUs, but here I told the, uh, and these are the defaults, uh, um, but I told the, the virtual box that the virtual machine only knows about two CPUs. Um, so after you select that, you press import, and a few minutes later, it will be installed. So I'll, I'll cancel out of this because I don't want to wait a few minutes. Okay, and here's what you what I have after it's installed. Here's a list of virtual machines, and here's the Com Suite virtual machine here on the left, and VirtualBox, and then I'll press the Start button. So it has started and here you have a brand new computer. Now I have two computers running on one computer. And you can see the desktop, you can see the menu here that there's an off, a menu for turning it off and a button for turning it off. And uh, here are different menu options. There's a 
This is just the standard Ubuntu desktop with some customization. Um, so let's go back to the slide set. Um, there are more details in the getting started with ComSuite virtual machine document, which we've sent around. Um, if you don't have it, you can ask again for it. Uh, and if you have any problems with installing uh, VirtualBox or the virtual machine, uh, please just contact us on the Slack channel. Um, then, uh, and you can continue contacting us after the school is finished. Uh, this is not just during the school. Um, then there's uh, more troubleshooting documents from the Quantum Mobile site um, right here. And then last, uh, then I want to say a little bit about what is Incom Suite. Um, so I'll go back to the virtual machine desktop and I'll open the file manager. It's this thing up here, looks like a filing cabinet. And I'll go to the codes directory. And all of Com Suite is in this code directory. There's uh, actually two copies of Com Suite. There's one here called Compiled Com Suite Code, which is one where we've compiled every single bit of Com Suite and it's ready to go for you to run. Another one is Com Suite Code. It's what it looks like before it's compiled. So if you want to go through the steps of compiling it yourself, you can just go into this directory and start playing. I'm going to show you one thing that's going to be crucial for you as you use Com Suite because we use text based, the text-based interface a lot. It's this terminal here. So there's the terminal. And so if you want to go into uh, uh, the code directory, I did CD code, sorry. Uh, CD codes. Okay. And LS shows me all the directories in there. So now I'm going to go to the compiled sweet code directory and then I'll look at everything in there. So now I'm doing the equivalent thing in the file manager. And here it shows me all the directories in the um, com suite. Uh, and so now I want to talk about what are the main components of com suite. Okay. Um, one key component that's what Andre's talking about yesterday and today is RSP flat W, um, which is a code that handles extended systems, but extended systems would basically mean crystals. So Vincent, I'm sorry, why it is RSP flap? It's not uh, the name of the code. Okay, so what do you want to call it? It's flap for MVPT. Great. Okay. Um, so FLAP MVBT or SP FLAP W is uh, for uh, extended systems, uh, crystals, and it knows how to handle all the details of, him, of, uh, of an infinite number of atoms uh, arrayed in a crystalline format, okay? And it uses techniques suitable for systems without terribly strong correlations. Uh, it has DFT, it has hard to clock, it has hybrid functionals, uh, G naught, W naught, self consistent GW, quasi particle GW, and vertex correction. Um, uh, sorry, there is no G0 double E0. Well, I think it is if, if, no, you, run G, no. if you run GW for one it iteration. Is, no, it's not okay. correct. So you, you have to remove this. And also, okay. you have to remove hybrids because there is no hybrids there. Uh, there was before. No, there are no hybrids. Okay. Well, we also have a version of, of, of that code that has hybrids in it. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, <laughs> next, there's a code called CTQMC, which is a DMFT solver for the single side impurity problem. And here, I just want to show you where these codes are in the directory. So there's the RSP flap W. Um, 2021, right here, which is on base code. Uh, um, then there's the CTQMC right here. And the CTQMC is a DMFT solver for the single site impurity problem. Then there is the um, <coughs> um, 
there's a side guts, which is a which is a guts Wheeler solver for the single side impurity problem. So it solves the same problem but uses a different approximation. And it, it is more approximate, but it gives it's a lot faster and a lot less demanding computational resources. Um, and that's inside of Tom RS RISD here. And I'll come to that in a minute. Then a, a fourth component is Tom Suite, which is basically Python code that ties together uh, flat WMBT and CTQMC, uh, so that so that it can so that it can do a, a combined uh, say DFT and DMFT calculation or combined GW and DMFT calculation. Um, uh, now, Tom Suite also includes utilities for choosing Vonier functions uh, for calculating the Hubbard interaction U from first principles using CRPA and for calculating the double count interaction from first principles. And that's not all, those are just some of the major things. So, and then lastly, there's COMRISB, which is a Python code that ties together our uh, flat, flat WMBT and SIGUTS. So it, it allows you to do DFT and uh, DFT and guts Wheeler, or it allows you to do GW and guts Wheeler. Um, so that's what these parts are. There's a, uh, just telling, showing you what they all are. And, and so if you want to... Uh, uh, Listen, I'm sorry, could you show please what are uh, examples uh, directory in the, in the tone? Uh, in that uh, box. Yeah, well, you know, you have it on, uh, it's, it's on every virtual machine. Um, it is. So okay. could you please go inside on that examples? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mine is the same as yours, Andre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I saw. Okay, uh, I just wanted to mention what we're, what we're planning to do for supporting you. We. We will support you uh, uh, both during and after the school. We'll support all the code on this uh, on this virtual machine. Um, the best way to contact us for, for support is to is to is to our, our Slack channel because that gives you visibility to the whole Com Suite team, um, so that each of us can be aware of uh, how your concerns are being handled and do our best to help you. So it's better to use Slack than to use any personal one-on-one -on -one communication, and I would prefer that you use Slack. Um, and we uh, will support any your installation of Com Suite on any computer, any operating system, and we will support um, your uh, attempts to uh, calculate any material you like, as long as it's within uh, our feature set. Um, and we'll try to troubleshoot. And, and in fact, we really need your help uh, uh, bringing things to our attention so we can get some feedback about how well our, our software works and what your real concerns are. So we really stand to profit by any interaction with you and we really need you. Um, so, and then I was planning to say something about why to use ComSuite. I wanna say one thing is uh, our, uh, GW implementation uh, can do amazing things uh, with very restricted resources that basically no other uh, GW implement implementation can do. We have also a very good state-of-the-art EMFT and guts roller, and we have ways of tying it all together. Um, uh, so I, there's a lot of uh, state-of-the-art stuff here, and there's also uh, Things here that that are actually a little bit beyond state of the art, and there's a lot of it, a lot of thought about how to make things work together. So we hope that you really get a lot out of this code and learn a lot, and we and we, we know that whatever interaction we have with you, uh, we'll learn a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent. Mm -hmm. Vincent, just there's a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. So uh, a question, uh, is there an admin password for the virtual machine? Um, there, you can try Moritz, M-O-R-I-T-Z, okay? But uh, um, it shouldn't need, what you might want to do is, uh, in, in fact, for me, it never needs a password. Um, 
but there was one user who, who, who found that it wanted the password and asked me about that yesterday on Slack. And that user found that uh, if he just turned off the virtual machine and virtual box and then turned it back on again, the next time it virtual box, the virtual machine turned on, it didn't ask for a password. So, uh, um, right. So you can try Moritz, M-O-R-I-T-Z, um, lower caps, because that was the password for um, quantum mobile. But in fact, I don't think it really needs any password at all. You might just need to turn off the virtual machine and get started. If Moritz doesn't do it for you, please write, and I'll see if, uh, if there's something else we can do for you. OK. Um, can you give a comparison on using flat W and BT for DFT calculations versus yeah. other? Yes, Robert? No, go, go ahead. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, I mean, uh, our DFT GW code is an LAPW code. Uh, and it is a extremely efficient basis set. Quantum Espresso and VASP because both use plane wave basis sets, um, which is a trade-off. Um, uh, part of the trade-off is that uh, um, they can do forces much more easily um, than we can uh, because of, uh, they don't have a distinction between what's inside the muffin tin and what's outside the muffin tin. Um, uh, so it's more systematic and it, it allows forces uh, a lot better. Um, uh, and it also simplifies their code a bit. Um, so, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, we get uh, uh, what we get in return for using the, the special basis set is we get a, a lot of computational efficiency um, uh, in terms of CPU and memory. Uh, so we can do uh, calculations in a second that might take a minute with uh, one of those other. And also we can do uh, the core electrons in, a, in, a, in an atom. Uh, we don't have to use pseudo potentials. Um, uh, there are some approximations for the core electrons, um, but, uh, but it's really very accurate. And that's the reason why another code in the same genre as ours, uh, VIN2K is, is widely regarded as the most accurate um, DFT. Uh, have an issue code. It's because it, it, it takes care of the core electrons. And um, so we're sort of in the same genre with being 2 k and, and other ones like that. Um, so um, uh, on the other hand, uh, our focus, uh, you know, uh, Quantum Espresso and VASP have been under development for decades. Uh, by a, a fairly large set of developers um, and many, many interested parties. Um, and uh, um, they have a very large feature set, very rich, and they can do all sorts of things that our code uh, can't do. Um, our code can uh, calculate um, uh, electronic structure. Um, uh, it can uh, um, and then it can go on and, and calculate, uh, um, it go on to next uh, levels of accuracy in GW and there it really shines because with GW, it's not just using the special basis set, um, but it's also using a, a, a particular approach to GW called the space-time method. And the space-time method allows us to do one GW iteration uh, uh, in a minute uh, and to do self-consistent GW, uh, I mean, in a minute for, for, for simple materials, um, which is unheard of um, from other GW codes. Um, so uh, it's a really uh, a very efficient code. Um, it's been designed for that from the beginning and uh, um, that's what it really shines at. Um, and then going beyond that, there's uh, vertex corrections um, which you've heard a little bit about. And uh, as far as I know, no other code has a, an implementation of, virtual, of vertex corrections like one that we do. Um, 
So um, that's sort of some of the pluses and minuses. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it really, it really, in terms of computational resources and so in terms of what you can get done uh, with GW on a on a PC or on a small cluster, um, this uh, this code is really special. Okay. More questions. How about the electron phonon interaction? You know, we don't have it. Um, uh, <laughs> that's one of those features that uh, uh, that uh, those other codes have had time and developers to implement, and we haven't. Um, uh, we uh, um, we do have some things on the way to that because it's a GW code. Uh, uh, a very basic building block in the calculation is the calculation of the susceptibility, uh, uh, and and having the susceptibility is like most of the work towards getting uh, the uh, phonon uh, the phonon spectrum. And using the all electron code, presumably I can check the strength of the spin orbit coupling for the core hole state. I think this is something that that Andre should handle. Um, I, uh, um, the, okay, the, uh, the, the, just a minute. Uh, there are some approximations in how this code handles uh, relativistic calculations and spin orbit. And uh, um, so it's a little bit of a complex story um, uh, about how those things are handled. If you want to see uh, a little bit more about it, there's a recent uh, article that Andreas put up on this topic, um, but Andre is really the person to discuss with. Okay, the, that uh, uh, question uh, is yes, if you are uh, able to include a particular core state into violent states. There are some possibilities, but of course, the deeper core state is, you have to take more uh, frequencies, more uh, a lot more frequencies, a lot more time uh, points to describe it properly. Uh, there is no special uh, treatment uh, uh, core whole state if core is described by as a core state, not as a valence state. So everything which is uh, 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 developed for GW or vertex correction schemes is applicable to valence state. So if you want to uh, look at the core, how it affects core states, you have to include the core state into the valence show. Okay. So if you want to discuss more, Andre will be around to discuss. Um, then about uh, Professor Kotlier's lecture about the modern theory of polarization. We do not have, this is another feature that other codes have and we don't. We don't have a feature for calculating the, the polarization. I'll give a minute for any other concerns. Uh, actually, I have a question, uh, um, whoever can help. Uh, we will be doing some um, calculations. I would uh, ask if it is possible to somehow see if everybody accomplished particular running or not yet. So uh, it's kind of yes or no question. But I would uh, like to see how I can know if everybody is finished this particular run. Is, it, is there a, such option in, uh, in this uh, Zoom uh, software? No, Andre. No, no. I don't, I don't think we can but, monitor everybody's. So how we can uh, do that particular because I believe the speed of computers are different and um, some will be waiting. Uh, we have to somehow uh, make sure that we know that everybody has accomplished previous step. I know approximately so how, much it, how much it, 
I think I think what would make sense is to take that approximate time and add a little bit. Yeah, the point I, I would just uh, tell about my experience. I, I know how much takes particular specific uh, job on my computer, but it is without Zoom. Uh, with Zoom, it is might be factor of three slower. And I believe that this slogan is also dependent on what kind of computer, what is the resources. So yeah, we approximately can guess, but it's might be you know, a factor of three maybe. If it is just a few seconds, it doesn't matter, but if it is uh, like a half an hour job, uh, it already matters. I mean, my experience with Zoom and with the virtual machine is that as long as the virtual machine is not using all the CPUs on the laptop or on the PC, Zoom just continues going basically the same way that it would. And the virtual machine keeps on going without knowing about Zoom. So you just have to make sure that that the that there's some uh, memory and some CPU left over for the host computer. And then okay. Zoom will, will function normally and the virtual machine will function normally. Of course, then there's a question of how fast are the CPUs on the computer and how much, uh, yeah, and that's that's it. But the nice thing about, about your code, about our, our code is that, uh, um, is that actually these uh, tutorials run very, very quickly. So here's a question, maybe on Slack, the participants can like or dislike a message. Now well, that's an idea, we can try it out. And then if you're running it on VirtualBox with a specific amount of RAM and CPUs, yeah, somebody, somebody saying, okay, if you have a certain amount of RAM and CPUs, you don't, he, he doesn't think there'll be a lot of variability. Well, there is some variability in the, how fast the CPUs will get their job done. But the other thing is that um, some, some people will only be able to give one CPU to the, to the calculation. Um, and there is, actually, there is a big difference in CPUs. If you have a CPU on an ultra thin notebook, um, those are sort of dumbed down CPUs um, and they'll run a lot slower than, than CPUs on uh, more conventional laptops and PCs. Um, uh, and then uh, um, of course there'll be differences in caching and so on, um, but uh, 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 then the amount of RAM. Oh, and the other thing is that some people will only be able to give one CPU to the calculation. And if they have a, if they have only one CPU on their computer, then that CPU will have to help both the, with the, with the um, com suite calculation and with Zoom at the same time. So then their computers may slow down because uh, when you start a com suite calculation, basically it, if it forever, however many CPUs it gets, it grabs everything it can from that CPU. That CPU will be running at 100%. Um, so um, that's why it's important to. Uh, so if you have only one CPU and you um, and that CPU is being used by Com Suite, um, you'll find that the rest of the computer slows down some. It should still continue to work if it's a decent operating system, but it will be less responsive. Okay, so should we go ahead? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll stop this. I, I guess I'm not screen sharing, so I'll just stop the video. Could you take me off as co-host, I guess? And then, uh, so, and then uh, okay, I'll mute. So go ahead, Andre. Oh, okay, so uh, let's start then. Um, uh, I would ask everybody to go to that directory which Vincent shown. Uh, sure. Sure. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah. So um, I'm using my Linux shell. 
Uh, so in that directory, as uh, Vincent shown us that there are some examples, they have the same exactly names. So I will wait till uh, a few minutes or a couple of minutes to ensure that everybody is there. And there is another directory which Vincent shown us, uh, which is uh, compiled codes. So you should go to FLAP and BPT uh, code and under the name of source, source, there is a flat mpt that is executable. So please find directory with examples and directory with executable. Okay, there's because, a question. Yeah. How to get how to get on Andre's view on the terminal. And you won't get this view on the terminal. Andre's using a Midnight Commander piece of software, and uh, and Midnight Commander is not in, is not installed on the uh, not installed on the virtual machine. Yeah, it's a, like a, you can use a, a ls command and see the content of specific directory. Uh, it's just easier for me to see you know, screen like this. Yeah. And uh, so. Um, On Andre. Yeah. Since they have to use the command line, maybe can you use the command line as well? Well, yeah, I will be using it when I'm uh, running examples. Uh, it's just easier for me to copy files from one to another using this. Uh, so, yes, but you want the students to follow. They can't do this because they don't have midnight commanders. So if you can just do everything from the command line. Um, yeah, I, I will try. OK, I will try. But it's uh, not easy for me, but I will try. Okay, at least I will be saying by words what uh, uh, everybody has to do. The first action, the first action I would ask you is to copy executable, to copy executable from that source directory to the directory which in Florian uh, LDA. I already did it, so you can see the any file and executable. So I believe in a shell, it would be like copy. Then you have to put the name of the directory where uh, executable is. I don't know what is the name, but you should see it on your screen. And then copy this executable. Like somewhere, where is your example, sir? It's some example. I, 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 again, you should put specific directory where are you, your examples are. So, okay, let's start then this. I believe, I believe it's easy for everybody, but not for me. So, uh, first example. Uh, this is uh, just a uh, lithium fluorine, uh, uh, simple LDA run, local density approximation. Uh, any input file, any uh, has a part. Uh, uh, Andre. Yeah. So the editor that the, the editors that they could use right now, and the, since we want you to do the same things that that they can do, uh, the suitable editors would be Emacs, or um, there's an editor that. When you click on a file in the in the um, when you click on the file, yeah, yeah, there the should be some manager. editor. There yeah, should be so some it, editor, I believe. Yeah, uh, if should... you could use that one, that would be good. Or if you could use no, Emacs. No, uh, Robert, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with this editor. I complete, uh, completely clumsy in it, so I would use this one. Otherwise, it will slow him down considerably. Yeah. Uh, there's Emacs or VI or yeah I know I but I, I don't I'm not familiar with what, uh, any of them I'm familiar only with this. Okay. 
So I believe uh, anybody ha has, everybody has to go use some editor which uh, you are familiar with. Andre. Uh, yeah. Your text is too small. They can't oh. see it. They can't see it. Well, this uh, issue, I'm not sure that I know how to increase the so, so text. Is it really Robert, visible? do you want to MC the questions? Because there have been about 10 more questions since then. Or I can just jump into the questions. Yeah, if you want to jump into the I mean, Corey is helping out here. Okay, school directory, there's no school directory. There's the codes directory, which I've shown you. Um, uh, can you please guide us to the directory with examples? If you go um, to uh, the codes directory and to compiled comp suite code, then uh, uh, let's see, so I know higher level. Um, Um, oh, I know. Okay, you go to the desktop. You go to your desktop of of the virtual machine, and the or, upper left hand corner, there's a file called readme.md. Okay, double click on readme.md. I'm sorry, I didn't show you this. Do you want me to? Do, I, I won't do a screen share. Stop. Just go to the Stop. upper. Yeah. Why don't we? That, why, don't, why don't you show explicitly, Vincent? So stop okay. screen sharing, Andre. You probably yeah. need to make me co-host yeah. again. Um, start video. Okay. Um, and then I'm supposed to share now. Share screen. Andre, stop sharing your screen. Oh, okay. Now I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I'll close this out. Um, close that guy out too. Um, so here I am at the the desktop, and I hope it's not really going to suddenly suspend. Uh, in the upper left corner, you see of the desktop, there's a readme.md file. Does everyone see this? Does anyone see it? Can you make the, the window bigger? Yeah, but the icon won't get any bigger. Yeah. Is that any better? Yeah. In the upper left corner, there's a readme.md file. Now I'll double click on it and I'll bring it up in the editor in the, the graphical editor that comes automatically with the virtual machine. And then um, there are notes here. Okay, there's a bit that spells out what the virtual machine is. Then there's a bit that, uh, which is a lot like the file that we sent you around about how to install the virtual machine. Um, then there's a bit about how to get started with the comp suite codes. Um, uh, and so how to run them. Uh, uh, and then, hey Vincent, yes. can you also make your font bigger for your resolution? Sorry. Let's see how I do that. Uh, let's see. You. I'm not quite sure how to do it, so I'm just sort of uh, playing it now. You go view, zoom in. That's true. Maybe I can try zooming in. Now the zoom functionality, I'm trying to use my mouse and the typical MacBook way to zoom in. No, zoom no. In. Go to view on the terminal. Let's see a view. 
Is it here? Uh, I have. I see a menu bar with file edit view search terminal. File. Try view. Try view. Click on view. Is there side panel? No. Okay. Um, these are the sorts of things that one thinks of during a school and not before. Um, let's, that just makes another document. Uh, okay. There must be some configuration possibility. I'm sorry, I'm not coming up with it right now. If I find a way, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, why don't you just take the students to the directory that Andre was talking about? Oh, I was trying to answer the question about, uh, there was some question about examples or something. So I was trying to answer that one. How, like, how do we get started running examples? So Andre was here in RSP FOTW June 2021. Then you drill down into examples. Okay, and then you go to CR. The, the, for, the force, uh, force, uh, lithium, fluid, OD, uh, it's a force. Force item. Force, force. Fourth, fourth item. item. Yeah, this one, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I think, I think actually, instead of using this, because you're going to have to run stuff, then you should start the terminal. So I would go over, I press this black icon on the left, and I started the terminal, and I'm already, because I was using the terminal earlier, I'm already in the, in the compiled com suite code directory. So now I will go down into the RSP flat W dot June. Uh, 2021 directory with the cd command the cd command takes you from one directory to another directory cd means change directory and now we'll go i'll cd into the examples directory right so now ls means show what's in a particular directory so i keep on cding and lsing all the time and uh <laughs> um now you said it was the fourth one, LIF LDA. So I will go LCD into IF uh, LDA LS and uh, uh, Vincent, could you please also show how to copy executable into this particular directory? Because that was the first question for me. Right. So what you need to do is I wouldn't copy the executable into there. I would just run it from the directory where it's present. Okay, so it, it, at least there should be explicit name of the directory. So yeah, it's in this file here. Yeah, when we run the code, it should be specifically directed where it's executable. So if you look in the readme.md file, um, there are instructions about how to run uh, RSP flat W, uh, the code that we're concerned with right now is the executable, the executable is named RSP flat W. Okay. Um, so, and in fact, there's an explicit exa uh, example here in the read, readme.md file that tells you what to run. So you go into this directory that I've CD'd into, okay. And, and then the instructions in the readme.md file say, um, and I'll just type it out as instructions say, npi run dot mp2 dash mp2. So that means use two processors. Uh, and then I'm going to give the path to the, to the place where the executable is located. So this tilde slash codes slash compile. And you find that if, if you press the tab button, the tab button will often complete the directory name for you. I just press the tab button and it, and it just looked for names in that directory that matched compiled. And it said, oh, there's only one. It's named compiled com suit code. So it completed it. Okay. And now I'm um, 
and then RST flat to the next directory name as RST flat W dot June. And I press tab again and I completed dot June June dot 2021 slash SRC, which is the source code directory, which is where the executable is located. And then the name of the executable is <laughs> flat WMVPT dot exit. And then the AND symbol, uh, I put a space and an AND. Okay. And then I press enter and it runs the tutorial. Is that what you want me to do right now, Andre? Yeah, but this command should be somehow stored in memory for everybody because it will be repeated many times. Yeah, it's in the it's in the readme.md file. So they can just cop, they can just follow the yeah, okay. read, they can just follow that. Also, uh, so I'm gonna start it and then I'm gonna show you if I press the up button, uh, actually I'm, I'll let it complete. It completed, okay. Did the whole calculation in a few seconds. Now I'm gonna press, you, you have arrow keys probably somewhere on your computer. If you press the up arrow key, it will take you back to the previous command that you ran. So if you, if you uh, so, and then you can edit it. So suppose I wanted to run some other executable that doesn't exist, that has a, a one in the name, then I just put in one, but wmbpt onegc and I would try running it. I could do whatever I like. And in fact, I have a complete record of all the commands that I've ever done on this terminal. And I can go back and forth, up and down, using the up and down buttons. Okay. So you can use that, that way you don't have to type in the command every time. Let's see back in Zoom, what we have going on in Zoom. Zoom. Question. I don't know why it keeps showing me the wrong thing. Uh, oh, I know it's because I'm doing screen sharing. Okay. So, okay, Wait. let me uh, go back to this. Somebody asked, can we use VIM? There is VI on this computer. You can try I it. Believe I believe my business way it would be easier to see if I put it like in a That's better, yeah. Is it better this way? Yeah, I mean, much better. It's much, much better. Okay, that's uh, already good. Uh, so we already run this example, but let me explain uh, uh, what is uh, is an input file. Uh, so there are some group of variables which should be always present in any input file. That's a mandatory input. And there are some space for the optional <clears throat> variables. Uh, the first group of variables always starts with number of DFT iterations. In this case, we, you can see 14 iterations. Then the next variable is post DFT. Uh, it means how many different uh, types of post DFT runs are there. For instance, if you I want to run just just up all you after that it should be one. I will explain how to do it, but just one. If you uh, want to run uh, GW and, and then after that uh, vertex corrections, you should put here two and then specify the next line how many iterations, which I will show later. Then uh, you uh, specify a uh, space group number, or there is also uh, another option here to specifically indicate the group generators. I will explain it later. In this case, we are using option space group number, which would uh, explicitly, implicitly define uh, uh, which iterations are present for this uh, system. Depending on what space group is, uh, we have to provide uh, lattice parameters. This is cubic system, so we have to provide only one lattice parameter at no angles because all angles are 90 degrees. But in more general, in, in the most general case, we have to provide three A, B, and C, 
translations and also free angles, like a tree cleaning system. Then we have to provide coordinates of independent only atoms, not all atoms, but only those which are not connected by symmetry. In this case, we have two atoms. Uh, and the coordinates are given in terms of the, of the fractions of the lattice parameter. Andre? Yeah? Are comments in this uh, preceded by a pound sign or a number sign? I'm so, so, sorry. I, uh, is is there yeah. this a question on chat somewhere? Yeah, the last comment. To put comments in this e file, I should use. Uh, no, no. Uh, comments, you can put comments afterwards, or like, uh, you know, um, after in the end of any line. Because uh, uh, what uh, code does, it actually, it knows how many numbers should be in every line. So uh, it reads only specific number of numbers. So if you put something like, like some explanation afterwards, it will be okay. Is it what you mean by this? Yeah, yes, I think that's what he means. Can yeah, you so you can put uh, comments uh, in the end of each line uh, using some uh, space in between the last uh, number and your comment. So, for instance, uh, when you read when uh, uh, code reads space group, so it's kind of keyword. After this word is uh, read, uh, code knows that there should be just one number here which should be re re read. And whatever is after that is already like a, you can put comment. Uh, okay. Um, this is a. Uh, and Andre, is that yeah? case sensitive and position sensitive? Is it sensitive it, to the amount of white space or? Yeah, actually, it is sensitive. So, yeah. Uh, actually, I usually use like uh, small letters, like it here. The only exception is that. Um, uh, uh, elements, uh, chemical elements, uh, are written in uh, like a capital and uh, small if, if it is two letters, and just capital if it is one letter, like a fluid in here. Uh, the rest of variables, uh, they are uh, low case. Maybe it is a good point for me to like uh, remove this uh, limitation uh, in the future versions. But right now, yes, it is uh, a low case. Uh, and in this example, there is only one uh, variable uh, which is uh, not uh, mandatory. It's accuracy level. So the idea of this variable is that I introduce two uh, levels of accuracy, like a zero, one, and two, in such a way that uh, when you raise the accuracy level, many important parameters like uh, number of k points number of plane waves interstitial number of frequencies for instance uh, they are kind of increase uh, so it's kind of a brute force to make calculation uh, more accurate without thinking much about any uh, variables uh, generally for demonstration purposes it's probably good to use uh, zero level for most of the calculations, uh, I'm using usually level one. And only level two uh, is for very, very precise LDA usually calculations when you have to check carefully with convergence and so on. Uh, but of course, usually I will explain later, I prefer to use manually manipulating of any variable because brute force uh, allows you to raise very simple accuracy, but also it very uh, makes calculation very quickly more time consuming because you increase everything at the same time. Sometimes it is not necessary to increase certain variables. Andre, there's another yeah. question, which is yeah. um, about the white space. So do you need a certain number of spaces between variable names or not? Uh, in between uh, keywords, there should be some space, not necessarily just one space, arbitrary space, but uh, uh, code should understand what the end of specific keyword is. Yeah, so just any number of spaces. Is yeah, okay. any number of spaces. Yeah, it's any number. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay.
And then uh, another question is um, whether accuracy level one is okay for publishable work. Yeah, yeah, generally is. But usually what I'm doing is uh, using <clears throat> uh, accuracy level one, but manually uh, checking convergence uh, with respect to most critical parameters for specific material, uh, like uh, K points, keeping everything else the same, or, or then uh, like a number of plane waves, again, keeping everything else the same. Because in this case, you can do a lot more flexible, flexible checking of convergence instead of just increasing everything by brute force. Yeah, but usually, yes, uh, when for publishing works, I usually put here one. Actually, by default, uh, the security level is one. So if you don't put here anything, it would be one. Okay. So um, I did these calculations before. So let's uh, go through the files um, uh, quickly. So principal output file is all out, all out. And it's just prints everything like uh, in the course of calculation. But the first, first uh, section of this is just to print uh, variables which were placed in any file manually or were taken by default. Uh, for instance, uh, there's a space group. This space group means that uh, group uh, generators uh, correspond to this symbol. So instead of, for instance, write 25 for space group, you can use sim gain with this number, with these symbols. Symbols are the following. This is inversion, rotation, threefold rotation around diagonal of the cube, and fourfold rotation around uh, Z axis. This is three generators. Uh, after multiplication with each other, they generate 48 operations of the space group. So uh, this is a lot of information. I will not, of course, describe everything. The point is that first section is um, that it prints a, all default uh, values. So you can take a look. And if you don't like something in this uh, default uh, variables, uh, you can then put it manually in input file with different uh, uh, parameters. For example, uh, here you can see the number of divisions in the Brillouin zone is three, three, three. For lithium fluorine, it's okay, but general for demonstration purposes, because it has very large band gap, so it's, but generally even for this material, it should be larger than three by three by three. Uh, then another important variable is Erka max, which defines number of plane waves uh, in the interstitial, which is the product of the uh, Muffin-Kin radius and uh, uh, length of the plane wave. Uh, it's also low. Usually, you would probably like to take a little bit more. Uh, so you can change by manual, uh, manually these variables. And so there are many variables. I believe I described at least most of them in the input file. Uh, so if by some reason I didn't, I forgot something, so please let me know and I will be updating that file anyway. And then uh, after printing this input information, uh, there's some information about neighbors. Then it prints like a DFT iteration one. And then it also prints uh, real time. So in this case, you see that there was four seconds before this step. And then it brings some information, which probably uh, might be interesting, like eigenvalues at gamma point uh, in, in Rydberg's here. Then you can take a look at matching of the density at the boundary of uh, muffin -Tin sphere. Uh, so we are using relatively small basis set uh, to consider that the value is mismatching slightly. Derivative is not very good, so on. Uh, for this element, actually, value is good enough. Derivative is pretty good as well. But of course, you can improve this much uh, if you increase number of plane waves and number of L max in the uh, inside machine sphere. 
So then second iteration or it's until convergence. In the end, you can take a look for, in my case, it took uh, uh, like 13 seconds. I believe uh, uh, Vincent did it like a, maybe a couple, uh, not couple, maybe three times faster, if I'm not mistaken. So that is basically the difference between computers. Okay, so another file, this, there are many files here. For instance, K points. I have to increase uh, because it, you know, there are, so here in this file, first of all, uh, translation in reciprocal space are given. And then uh, there are all K points. If we had three by three by three, so 27 points. And coordinates are given here is uh, in terms of fr fractions of this um, uh, reciprocal space translations and also in Cartesian coordinates and absolute lengths of the, of the vector. Uh, should I, maybe, uh, I'm not sure what. Another important, Andre, yeah? There's another question here, the last comment, if you want to take a look. Does inter intercept, intercept zero suggest better run? Uh, I'm not sure what this interset means. Is this, do they mean interstitial? Maybe? Uh, I, I, there is no such variable uh, interset equal to zero, no. Uh, in interstitial, uh, the variables for interstitial, uh, let me show. Um, so, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, not here. Uh, it's called uh, RK max. This variable controls uh, the size of the interstitial basis set. Is it what I, you were asking? So it should be larger for better uh, accuracy, but you should understand that uh, augmented plane waves is not a complete basis set. And at some point you, you will hit linear independence. So you have to converge. Usually you can converge before hitting linear dependence. So you can increase this until you converge. Okay, so this code can give the band structure without doing pre-run SKF. Um, so band structure actually is for DFT runs, there is a file called DFT bands dot. It gives you eigenvalues as a function of the directions in the Brillouin zone. And this file, you don't have to look inside what is there, but you actually can take a fi file DFT bands dot GNU for GNU plot. I'm using GNU plot for plotting. And in this particular file, uh, uh, it's actually addressing the dot file. You see, what you have to do here is that you should put specific path uh, where you want to get uh, EPS, uh, EPS file, the file with plottings. And also you can have to put specific path where is your dot file sitting. That's only two actions. And then you can run GNU plot, GNU plot and uh, print uh, uh, band structure. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, there are some questions here. Let me take a look. Uh, does the code run a calculation at each? Yeah, no, 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 at each only at the irreducible K points, of course. 27 is all K points. We have 48 uh, symmetry operations. So we uh, apply uh, this symmetry operation and uh, look which of these K points are independent. And uh, actually, the information how many independent points. Is here, I will show you. So after printing the uh, default variables, there is a print uh, 4K points of A type generate. So you have only four uh, irreducible K points in this case. So the code actually runs 4K points. Andre, the, uh, 
The yeah. question about the interstitial was where it's showing the muffin tin and interstitial values at the boundary and the derivative and the second derivative. Oh, uh, okay. There, there is a very variable um, which, uh, okay, it's probably not in the, is, uh, let me see. I, I understand, I believe that uh, the code uh, checks actually uh, what is the radius of touch and muffin tin sphere is. In this case, um, uh, it's uh, 1.8 uh, uh, more radiuses for lithium and 2.0 for fluorine. And as you see, uh, by default, uh, the code takes exactly these touching uh, values. Why they are different? Uh, there is a default that for certain, depending on the nuclear size, uh, uh, there are some weights for the uh, atom. So for instance, a uh, heavy atom, which has a lot of electrons usually uh, has larger weight. So they are not equal normally, but uh, the larger atom has by default larger muffin radius. But you can uh, change, change everything of this, change everything. Let me show how to do that. Uh, I just will open the description file. That's probably a good idea to open it. So uh, this is an input file, which is on the website. So whoever is interested can download and uh, take a look. So uh, the variables which control uh, muffin tin radius is uh, if I understand uh, the question. Uh, let me take a look, what is it? Uh, one second. Yeah, it's a SMT weight. So uh, there is some, uh, is it possible to see that screen? Ah, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm um, sorry, I forgot to show. So this is a input, uh, uh, <clears throat> description of input variables. Is it possible to see right now? I'm sorry, I have, okay. <coughs> okay, so in this file, uh, there are variables, um, SMT weight and SMT scale. This is for to uh, change default weight. And here is uh, also, you can put, besides what was generated by default in a uh, touch and uh, marking radiuses, you can put some scale. So it would be only a fraction of this uh, generated uh, radius. Also, if you put a negative value here, then specific value would be used, which is uh, you put here independently on the defaults. So you can use, for instance, when you change volume, uh, by default, uh, muffin radius changes according to the uh, volume, but you can fix uh, specific value and it will be fixed independent on the volume. Okay, let me go back. So uh, another uh, maybe important file for DFT runs is uh, uh, eigenvalues. Eigenvalues at uh, points of high symmetry. Okay, this way. So what is here is that a number of K, uh, K points, as you remember, there are four independent uh, K points. And here eigenvalues in electron walls given at relative to chemical potential. As you can see here is a band gap because there are some numbers are all negative and the next band, uh, they're all uh, positive. 
we can also quickly see that actually band gap is formed by a gamma point. See, this is the highest valence band among others, and this is the lowest conduction band uh, among others. And NLDA band gap is uh, like a 8.9, almost 9 electron volts. So this is a LDA result. Um, another point is, for instance, you can uh, take a look at result uh, density of states uh, for symmetry points. This is gamma point. This is actually a spectral function. Uh, for LDA, they exactly correspond to the eigenvalues. So peak of this function correspond to the eigenvalues. You see the peak is like a five and something. And uh, then above our chemical potential is somewhere like a nine or something, or no, three. So some is about eight, point, eight and something. Another file may be useful is density of states, but I have to warn you, but in order to, this is spin up, spin down, and full density of states, but in order to get smooth function, you have to take a lot more K points, because this is just weight uh, Fermi Dirac uh, summations over K points. And if you use only three by three by three mesh, you will get some delta function like peaks instead of smooth density of states. So please, if you need this file to use, you have to take more K points. That's basically all what is most important for simple LDA runs. So let's uh, proceed with another example. Uh, uh, here, I will not run it, I will just show it because I guess we are a little slow. Uh, what is also important uh, for runs is admix variable. This admix variable tells the code uh, for the iterations how much of uh, the new density have to be taken from new, uh, last iteration and how much should be taken from previous iteration in simple mixing scheme. Uh, of course, this affects rate of convergence, as you understand. If you take it too large, iteration will not converge. If you take it too small, iteration will converge, but it's too slowly. So there is some default system. For instance, um, if you look at the previous run, previous run, uh, uh, you can take a look what is the default for this particular material. For this particular material, material is a 0 0.377. So it's a little bit uh, too small, but it's okay generally. So this is just next example, just show you that you can change this variable. For simple material, I believe default uh, works pretty well, but for some complicated materials with a uh, large number of atoms, sometimes you can meet the situation, the iteration, uh, iterations are not convergent. So in this case, it means that default admix variable is too big and you have to manually reduce it uh, by just putting it here. Uh, in other situations, when you see that convergence is good, but too slow, you might try to uh, slightly increase it. And this uh, trying it should be done usually as a small number of K points because convergence depends a little bit, but not so much on the number of K points. So you can use fast calculations to check what is uh, admix variable uh, optimal value is for given material. Okay, another example accuracy level well we probably also will not just keep running uh, here i just manually change zero to one and uh, what is the result uh, for instance uh, let me check uh, here we had for instance if you look at the total energy in the end free energy is uh, like uh, 214 5284. And then we can compare this value. Oops. You can compare this value with um, when you put accuracy level one. Uh, here it's 213, 624. I can write it in order to make it more uh, 
convenient for you, let me write. Yes, I somehow missed my, so, um, now it somehow disappears. Okay, mean, let's see. Sorry, something. Okay, I pressed something which I shouldn't press. Okay. Andre, the, the zero energy is the chemical potential or the Fermi level. We have a question about that. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. There's a question about the Fermi level, which I think is. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Uh, there is a small difference between uh, uh, Fermi level and uh, chemical potential. In a quote, I'm using uh, chemical potential for the uh, zero uh, level because uh, quote is based on finite temperature. So there is a small difference. And the larger temperature, the bigger difference is. So Fermi level, you can define like uh, the highest occupied state uh, and so on. But uh, for if the temperature is not zero, there is always some very small uh, spectral weight, uh, you know, beyond that because of Fermi Dirac uh, distribution. So the ke uh, chemical potential is always slightly different from uh, Fermi level. It's important to uh, understand because sometimes uh, if we plot band structure, for instance, and we have very small band gap, then you can see that actually the zero level, which is chemical potential, sometimes might be crossing the conduction band, for instance. Uh, is this is because there is a difference between Fermi level and chemical potential. In this case, you have to just redefine manually in a GNU plot file uh, what is the zero level, which should be uh, corresponding to the highest valence band if you want to put zero at the Fermi level, not at chemical potential. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I'm trying to save time because we kind of uh, slow a little bit. So, so I'm not running all examples, uh, uh, but I'm just showing uh, what is the difference from in any file uh, for the next example as compared as compared to the previous one. Uh, this one is important, uh, restart, how to use the restart option. And I probably will stop a little bit more on this because this is really important, I believe. So what I can will do is just copy this in a file to show you the difference. So as you see, uh, there is um, exactly the same. I just reduced number of iterations in order to be able to continue. But I added variable restart end one. This variables, uh, variable tells the code that after accomplishing six iterations, uh, the uh, information which is needed for continuation is written to the disk and code stops. So this restart end one. And then after you wrote and then you want to continue the iterations, you put here uh, restart begin to, restart begin to, this means that everything which was written will be read. If it is one, then only part of it, uh, which is not related to basis set will be read. But for smooth continuation, you should put here restart begin to. And in this case, code, uh, instead of uh, starting from the beginning, from the overlapping atomic densities, it will read uh, information from the file and um, continue with eight uh, iterations. I believe it is uh, important, maybe you should try this particular run. So what I would like you to do is to copy uh, any file from original directory. So 
somewhere in new directory. And uh, just put manually like a six iterations and variable restart and one. I will run uh, as well. And then uh, you can start uh, running uh, as a uh, first example. Uh, my computer usually is slowing down when Zoom is active uh, considerably, uh, but maybe in your case it's better. So we did six iterations, and there is a file uh, raw restart. So this is uh, information for restart. But now I would like to ha have some information that everybody did it because I have no I, uh, uh, no knowledge if it is successful or not. Ah, uh, any one is just, uh, uh, I, uh, I just well, for show sure you, it's uh, just the same. Actually, actually code uh, always working only with a variable in and not any one. Any one is just copy. So what I can, uh, would like you to do after you run the first part and wrote the information in the restart part, restart file, you should go here and uh, Again, manually restart, no, low case, restart, begin to, and you can put here any iteration, number of iterations which you like, like eight for instance, iterations. And then you, what you do is just run the code again. So as, as you see, Continuation is smooth in this case. Uh, mismatch in density, you see it was reducing here, reducing, and it is con continuous to reduce. So this is how uh, restart LDA run, uh, works. It is very useful, for instance, when you want to check a convergence, for instance, you, uh, especially when you run forces, because forces only evaluated at the last iteration and uh, so you run, for instance, 50 iterations, uh, road restart file, and you look at the forces, but you're not sure that it's a converge or not because you did it only once. Uh, so you just run one additional iteration and compare it to runs uh, to two values. It's very easy to check convergence. Okay, I believe we are done with this example. Uh, let me go now, and I would ask you to do the same, uh, to go um, to go uh, for quasi-particle GW directory. So let me show you what is in any file. So any file has slightly more complicated structure, but not much slightly. So, Again, we will start with 14 uh, DFT iterations, but then we will do one type, one type of post DFT uh, calculation. In this case, it is quasi-particle. Quasi-particle means for uh, QSGW. And for this particular run, we will use six iterations. Uh, what else is here? I put temperatures by default that is 300 Kelvin, but I put it slightly larger just to make sure that uh, results, uh, because for 300 Kelvin, we have to take larger, more uh, frequencies and so on. So this is kind of safer to show uh, how it runs for slightly elevated temperature. The rest is exactly the same as an LDA round. So essentially the important addition is just post DFT one and number of specific iterations here. 
If you would like to run GW instead of QP, you have to put GW here. If you want to run uh, uh, first order vector correction, it would be psi from psi function over psi three. No, oops. So let me see. I already pre run it. Uh, so I would ask you maybe just to uh, try to run it. Just, uh, just press the same API run. Uh, temperature actually is for everything. As I said, uh, DFT is also finite temperature and it is used in uh, uh, Fermi Dirac distribution for k summations. So temperature actually is um, meaningful for any approach which is in this code. So in my case, six iterations of quasi particle uh, took uh, 255 seconds. It's like a, a slightly I have four minutes. Uh, I can run it again, just to, um, just to see how uh, Zoom slow this is down. And I would ask you the same, do the same. So you should use MPI RAM. Uh, minus np and how many cores you have and the path to the executable. So uh, it took like a four minutes. Uh, I believe if you if you are uh, using uh, two cores, it should be faster. Yeah, you can. Uh, the question is, uh, I see a temperature input in the GGA file. Yeah, so that's what I said. So temperature is meaningful also in the DFT uh, uh, in DFT uh, runs. So by default, it is 300 Kelvin, but you can change it all the time if you want to uh, take a look uh, how it runs for another temperature. So uh, as you see, uh, DFT. Yeah, we are in the Fermi QSGW. So DFT finished. Uh, this is the fast part. And let's see how it will proceed with uh, quasi particle. If somebody let me know how uh, uh, fast it goes, please just print this for already somebody did at least one quasi particle iteration because I just would like to know the difference in speeds. Is this called MPI only or does it also? Uh, no, it's a only pure MPI code. I'm not using open MP. So I, I, can, I can see already message that uh, two quarters, uh, two quarters uh, accomplish three iterations, which is very good. Okay, so I, I can see all six iterations in two minutes, these two quarters. So it means that your computer is much faster than mine. Yeah, much faster. So, yeah, yeah, I, I can see. So about two minutes for on two quarters. Yeah, okay. So for, for my in my case, I have used I, I have one core. So it's um, yeah, four minutes for one core and two uh, minutes for two quarters. Yeah, it's reasonable. Mm -hmm. But I believe that with Zoom, I will be even slower. Okay, I, I'm, I finished one iteration. All right, uh, I probably will stop and just uh, go with you on the output files, if you don't mind. Because it's running. So I, I will go to output files. Um, uh, what is different as compared to LDA case? Uh, is the following. Here you can also look at the quasi particle DOS file, density of states, in addition to the DFT uh, density of states. It's, it's here DFT density of states, quasi particle density of states. Then uh, K resolved DFT uh, density of states and K resolved quasi particle density of states only for symmetry, high symmetry points. In this case, we have only one gamma point of high symmetry. 
And also, we have eigenvalues. We have uh, DFT eigenvalues, which we already looked before. As you remember, uh, there is uh, uh, about nine electron volts band gap in DFT case. You can also take a look at the same in quasi particle. Uh, and you can see that we also have a uh, gamma point uh, which, which defines the band gap, highest uh, valence bands and lowest conduction. But gun, band gap in this would be about 16 electron volt. So it is uh, experimental results is 14.2. So uh, you see, we improved the result. So LDA underestimates band gap by about five electron volts. Uh, now we overestimate it by about two, uh, but this is improvement. That's what's approximately quasi-particle GW does. Even if you increase number of K points by the set, you will get approximately the same 16 and something electron volts. Uh, okay. So, so another. There are some files with partial density of states. Uh, for instance, DFT and quasi-particle. Uh, what is here? This is fluorine. This is a, uh, a chemical element, fluorine. And also it says volitium. Let's take a look at fluorine. Uh, this is uh, um, energy with respect to chemical potential in electron volts. And then SPDF. So let's take a look what is uh, actually is it a band gap is about minus one. So it's actually defined almost all together by, by P states uh, in this case. So lithium or P states of lithium. Oh, okay, I, oh, I'm sorry, I can see a lot of questions here. Let me stop. Um, the temperature input is not for post DFT GW iteration, it is for handling the calculation of the Green's function and the density of states. It is necessary even for the stratal D calculation because oh, it's, it looks like an answer, right? Somebody answered. Yeah, Vincent. OK, thank you, Vincent. This right, yeah. Uh, can you illustrate some results with plots instead of just the numbers? Uh, yeah, I have, of course, some plots. Uh, OK. Uh, For instance, uh, for instance, uh, I have some plot, plots, um, density, uh, Kaley salt uh, density of states where, where we can explicitly see the electronic structure. Let me, okay, let me stop sharing this. I have to go to another. Uh, for instance, at uh, Kelly salt density of states uh, for lithium fluorine, uh, uh, there are three uh, high symmetry points. This is another calculation uh, uh, gamma, X, and L. So, different color. Uh, from this particular plot, you can see that band gap is formed uh, uh, by gamma point. You see the highest valence state and lowest uh, conduction state. So, and you can also see the like, uh, transition energy for different uh, K points. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there's some other uh, question. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, so a code uh, creates a file for new plot for plotting DFT band structure. Uh, no, no, quasi particle, I didn't uh, yet implemented it. Uh, so it's going to be in some future. So right now we have only uh, DFT band structure for plotting because quasi particle part uh, requires some interpolation uh, in between uh, K points in regular mesh. It is not like DFT, which can easily run at any given uh, K point. So some interpolation uh, sh should be involved. But there's uh, there's uh, some options inside of Com Suite. You can uh, do a move on your uh, Com Suite uh, interface. Yeah, I believe uh, there with, are some with, uh, uh, in Com Suite, there are some uh, other uh, software which can do one year interpolation. Yes, but it is not on the in this flat in the beginning. Yes. Yeah, but it's on the it's on it's on the VM, so you can do it. Um, and also, I think doesn't don't you produce uh, files uh, uh, from your calculation with the uh, with with the eigenvalues associated with the quasi particle bands? Quasi uh, particle, yeah. I, I guess I've shown. Uh, so there there are those eigenvalues, so you could use them to to build uh, a band structure if you wanted. Yeah. Let me. Let, yeah. 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 Let me show. Yeah, of course. Uh, but well, it is. Uh, it, band yeah, structure, right? yeah. Let me let me take a uh, look at show. Um, for example, uh, uh, some simple simple variant, let me, not quasi particle to W. The format of this file is uh, exactly the same uh, for quasi particle or LDA. It's just easier to do with LDA because it has it, uh, quicker. So DFT dot Ike. So what is here? There are some uh, K points uh, pl plotted, independent K points. When you use sufficient number of K points, for instance, what you can do is to look at K points list point list and figure out, for instance, uh, in certain direction in a brilliant zone, uh, which K point connect, uh, for instance, uh, like point 12 in this case, right? Um, and for example, gamma point. In this case, we, sm we have a small number of K points, so it's probably not uh, easy to see. But in general, you can figure out uh, which point uh, aligned exactly on specific direction. So you cannot plot points which is in between, but you can plot at least a few points uh, along certain direction. Okay, this is a quasi particle just double. Let me show a little more about uh, another example. There are a, yeah. a few more questions too that have come up. The last three messages. Chat. Yeah, okay, yeah, I, I can take them. Yeah. Uh, could you please explain the structure of electronic density for? Ah, okay, that's I can do. Electronic density, for instance, we go in output file. Some of them, yeah, this electronic density. So, uh, this is uh, electronic density inside of muffin tin spheres. So inside muffin tin spheres, uh, electronic density is expanded in spherical harmonics. And depending on the L max uh, and on symmetry of the material, there are only few irreducible components. In this case, L max is three. And so only one irreducible component, which is one which is a spherically symmetric part. In cubic materials, as you know, the next uh, non-zero component is for L equal to four. So if we increase by manual, by, by hand, L max from three, which is default to four, we will have a couple more uh, components. 
So this is a distance uh, in Bohr radiuses from the nuclear. And this is uh, just value of the radial component of the density. So you can see it starts from some constant. And then if you uh, look at the end of the file, you can see that this is muffin tin radius. So 1.8 Bohr radiuses. And density is, has some smaller value. Then we have another sort, which is fl fluorine. This is for lithium and then fluorine. Again, in this case, L max probably is four because we have two more components. And because atom is slightly more heavy, so L max is slightly larger by default. Again, we have a radial distance from zero to till muffin tin. And then three components, uh, three reducible component, spherical symmetric, which starts from some uh, constant, and L max four, which starts from zero, of course. And then you can take a look at how it goes to the muffin tin radius. So muffin tin radius is two bore radiuses here, as you see, and the values of the density at this muffin tin radius. So this is the structure of this file. Okay, I believe uh, there is no more questions. Ah, so there's there's one asking if they can find the dielectric matrix somewhere in output. Let me see. What is that question? There's also one asking for plots instead of just numbers. Here, I'll, I'll uh, copy them back down to the bottom for you. Let's see. Ah, can I find the dielectric matrix? Oh, okay, the dielectric matrix. Okay, I see. This is a question belongs to quasi particle or GW, not LDE. So in LDE, we don't have it. Uh, let's see, for instance, quasi particle GW. Uh, so what I have here is, for instance, uh, uh, tensor. This is a microscopic tensor, dielectric tensor. Uh, for instance, you can see that uh, zero frequency is 1.5. I believe experimental value is like a 2.1 or something for lithium fluorine. So GW and quasi particle GW usually underestimate uh, this value. But also you can check when you have access to larger computer uh, how this converges when you increase number of K points because it's kind of sensitive to the number of K points. Uh, what I do in this uh, uh, in, in order to get it, I take some direction for cubic system is just one arbitrary direction and uh, numerically differentiate uh, the polarizability and then from that derivative i second derivative i can do uh, evaluation of the microscopic uh, dielectric tensor for instance so that's where it is uh, like uh, you no know, uh, e tensor that q for the particle there is also inverse, inverse, uh, uh, it's just inverse tensor. Uh, there is polarizability as a function of frequency for some symmetric uh, K points, gamma points, and some other points of high symmetry as a function of frequency in electron volts. So essentially, that's what is used. Um, for differentiation. So there is a gamma point. This is kind of should be exact, in exact theory, it should be zero, but it's minus six because we have some approximations. Uh, so we kind of differentiate the uh, value of gamma point and uh, as the point in certain direction. Okay. Uh, does the data include full direct values, not just electronic? No, it's only electronic. Uh, uh, it doesn't include any uh, phonon uh, contribution. So for some materials, of course, it is highly inaccurate because for highly, uh, uh, this, this strong neutron phonon interaction, values can be quite different. And then there is one more, this one here. Yeah, I want, I want to, can you explain again the difference between quasi power? Ah, okay, this is uh, okay. I can explain that. Uh, so, 
in in calculations, as I uh, was talking yesterday, uh, self energy has always a static part, which is frequency independent, or we can call it Hartley Fock part. Or here I call it exchange. X uh, uh, stands for exchange. Exchange part and dynamic frequency dependent part. So in calculations, I always first take a static uh, part, which is Hermitian, and I diagonalize corresponding Hartley Fock problem and get some eigenvalues. And these exactly eigenvalues from Hartley Fock part are here. You can see that band gap in this case are much larger. It's like a 21 uh, electron volts. And then I'm using this Hartree Fock eigenvalues and eigenvectors, eigenvectors as a basis set for the dynamic part. And after evaluation of dynamic part, uh, we have different. Uh, so a band gap squeezes, as you see, is like a 16 electron volts. So quasi-particle GW, as you see, much better than Hartley Fock uh, because 16 is much closer to 14 experimental than 21 to 14. So that uh, is the difference between quasi-particle and X eigen eigenvalues. So X means effective Hartley Fock eigenvalues, whereas quasi-particle is uh, for quasi-particle eigenvalues. Why we have also here QP and QP? Because in any kind of calculations, quasi-particle, GW, vertex correction, you always have this X part. So for instance, in GW uh, calculations, uh, we would have uh, GW X. And here we can also linearize it, and then you can have GW quasi-particle. But, but I will take, talk a little uh, later about it. But let me proceed uh, with GW. So, in the double case, essentially all is the same, like in quasi-particle. Uh, on the difference is that instead of QP, you have to place here GW and just run it uh, the same. So it's very easy. Uh, what is the difference here is that in all of the files, instead of QP, you can see in the end uh, GW. So that's the difference. But that is also very subtle difference in uh, uh, this particular file. As I explained, you see GWQP. What does it mean? In quasi-particle uh, run, uh, we, as I remember from yesterday, we linearize uh, dynamical part, and then we again uh, find eigenvalues. So the uh, K-resolved density of states in quasi-particle run exactly, so the peaks of it exactly correspond to the eigenvalues of the Hermitian problem. In full GW, it is not so. In full GW, we have full dynamical non-Hermitian self-energy. And in order to plot, for instance, spectral function, we have to analytically continue uh, dynamical part of self-energy and to real axis from Matsubara axis, and then, we can plot uh, diagonal parts of the corresponding Green's function on the real axis in order to see where the peaks of the spectral function are. So this actually uh, uh, is done for a point, and you can see minus 9.06 is the uh, highest uh, valence state, and the lowest uh, conduction is like a 7 and something. I guess it's also band gap is 16 and something, maybe slightly, only slightly larger than in quasi-particle case. But now, this is something which is fundamental, right? But now we would like to do something similar to quasi-particle and put some effective eigenvalues. What it is, so I take again dynamical self-energy, but only at the last iteration, not inside, but only at the last linearize it like in quasi-particle case and find eigenvalues. So this is kind of simplified analytical continuation. So instead of using Pade approach, I'm using just linear approach to analytically continue to the real axis. In some cases, actually in many cases, coincidence of the position of the peaks on the spectral function after Pade, and in this case are pretty uh, much the same. But if you remember the peak in, realistic 
spectral function was 0, 9, uh, 0, or 9, 0, 6. Now we have 9, 18. So, but on this scale, it's really very close. We have the same 16 and something electron volts for the band gap. So this is the only difference essentially between um, quasi particle GW and GW. You can also take a look at the dielectric tensor. You can see it is slightly smaller than in quasi particle, which actually means that in this particular case, uh, GW is slightly worse than quasi particle GW. Okay, so that's maybe you can try to run. So just uh, go to the directory where any file is and uh, run, uh, start, start running it in order to generate output file. Uh, so make sure that it uh, runs. And please uh, let me know if it somehow doesn't run. But I would like to show you one more option, which is very, very important, is how to restart in post DFT runs. How to restart in post DFT runs. So, in order to use a restart option in post DFT, uh, the scheme is slightly different. Slightly different. So uh, I would uh, start. Uh, let me. Uh, so, for instance, if you want uh, first to run four GW iterations and then uh, store information in the file, you should do the following. You should put the number of DFT iterations which you would like to converge, and then specific number of GW iterations which you would like to do. And then you have to put a restart end uh, one here. It's very important. Another variable which is important for GW runs is RST file. This variable tells you where to put a restart file because. Uh, as compared to DFT runs, where I actually restart file is very small, in GW, uh, other post uh, DFT runs, restart information is pretty big, and you have to be careful with disk space. So sometimes uh, you have some working directory with small disk space and some scratch directory with uh, big space. So in this uh, variable, you should indicate where is your scratch directory is where you would like to put restart information. Uh, here is just the same directory, which is by default, but you have to know where uh, this flexibility. And then you run it. I will not run because we are running out of time. I will just explain. But you can actually run during the lunch time. And then after, after you finished with this and then you like a uh, next day or something you would like to continue uh, but not from scratch but from this restart information first you have to you have to do is put zero into uh, dft iterations this will tell the code uh, not to do any dft iterations but read all dft information from for a restart file and also read all GW information from a restart file. There are a few restart files. And if you run an MPA, actually there are many files because every MPI process stores its own uh, version of the restart. But you don't have to care about it, it's just automatic. Uh, and then you put some number of iteration, it might be the same or might be a little different, which you would like. And that's all, you run. So information about uh, uh, restart is here. So the zero DFT inform, uh, iterations. That tells the code that it has to use restart information. 
okay, I, I believe there are some uh, discussion here. Uh, ah, it's an explanation. Uh, there is, uh, I was about to write to say that the version from last year is pretty similar to the one. Well, if it is question for me, uh, yeah. okay. What, maybe. Uh, yeah, there are a lot uh, more uh, output files. But my, many of the output files is uh, they are designed for mostly for uh, uh, developers or for person who already very well familiar with this code because uh, it's I I'm using them for debugging sometimes. Of course, if you are getting familiar with code, you will learn if uh, uh, what those files are. But I believe those the first uh, lecture. It would be just not reasonable to discuss any of them because many of them because we will uh, have no time for that uh, but uh, you are very welcome to ask a question about any specific file and i will try to answer the question so i guess we have to go for lunch so uh, whoever is interested to run uh, restart version of self consistent GW plus uh, do it as I explained. Namely, first you have to put some, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, repeating information. You put some number of DFT runs and restart end one and specify whether you have to store uh, restart files. And then you run some number of iterations. Then after you finish with that, for the second run, you put zero in number of DFT iterations. And you can change number of GW iterations, that's all. And you run it again. Okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, meet after lunch and I uh, uh, will show you some other options for DFT runs. And we at least discuss, maybe we can run some uh, very simplified vertex uh, correction uh, example. Thank you very much again. See you later.